Rebel? Someone who goes against control. Why didn't you give away my test taking skills? You skill? said it a couple weeks ago. Control, authority, or tradition. Anybody who goes against control, authority, or tradition um, is a rebel. When we think of rebels, we think of people who do bad things. They drink, they smoke, they get uh, tattoos and piercings, ride around on loud motorcycles, sex out of wedlock, all these things that we consider as, as a rebellion. Um, but if everybody is doing those things nowadays, what is true rebellion? Being a rebe rebel is, uh, is reading your Bible, is going to church, is believing in Jesus, is standing up for what you believe in rather than just going in and doing what everybody else tells you that what's true and what's not true. Um, like uh, you know, homosexuality. You know, it's very uncool to be against homosexuality in, in today's culture. Um, if you want to stand up for what you believe in, stand for the Bible, that's, you're, going to have to, you're going to be uncool. All right, so leading a rebellion, control, authority, or tradition. That's what we're going against if we're going to be a rebel for Jesus. So my question to introduce this topic is, how many of y'all are smarter than your parents? She just, she just coughed. You're smarter than your parents? I would get away with stuff. You get away with things? All right. Um, how many of y'all do things that your parents tell you not to do, or don't do things your parents tell you to do and can get away with? Check out the toy contract. What? Yeah, if your parents tell you to do chores and you don't do it. I don't hide chores. Or if your parents tell you not to do something and you don't do it. Or you do it. Or they tell you to do something and you don't do it. How many of y'all can get away with it? So you're smarter than your parents? I can't get away with it. What's that? I can't get away with doing something I'm not supposed to do. Okay. Um, Okay, I need everybody, I'm going to write your name up there. I want you to tell me what you do that you can get away with. And then, uh, I won't tell you. I'm just kidding. Stuff that happens at school. When I was in fifth grade, um, or so, my brother and I would get grounded from, like, watching, we'd get grounded from the TV program. But where I lived, we had this really long driveway, and so we could see our parents driving up the driveway. And uh, we had to we sit on the couch, and right there they had like three light switches. They had one, two, three. Well, the middle one controlled the top electrical outlet on one of the electrical outlets. You know, you've got a lamp plugged in, you want to turn off the light, you just flip that switch, turns off the lamp. But well, we had our television plugged into that. So I realized, hey, if I'm watching them drive up the driveway, bloop, that, that switch, TV goes off. And what's great about it is if I flip the switch back up, the TV didn't automatically come back on because it's an old television. So coming home doing what I was not supposed to be doing, flip that switch. Yeah. Some of y'all know my parents, and if you rat me out, I will rat you out so hard. She's never given you pie. Who spilled this slush? <laughs> All right, moving on. So, um, then I met Jesus, and I put aside all of my bad ways. And I never did anything bad again. <laughs> uh, next question. How many of y'all have ever done something and got caught and you couldn't figure out how your parents caught you? You're like, what in the world? Okay. Anybody want to share one thing? Okay. Your, your, this, is, this proves that your parents or your teachers are smarter than what you think they are because... If you do something and you get caught and you're like, how in the world did they know that I did that? <laughs> Are you got a snitchy sister? Okay. We have, let's see, my dad was telling a story when he was in high school. They had these, like, study halls. I don't even know if schools have study halls anymore. You gather everybody together, not everybody, but a lot of people in this big room. And you're supposed to be studying for your next class or doing homework or things like that. Well, they have study halls. And my dad would walk into these things, study halls, and the teacher would walk in, and he'd kind of sit down, and he would sit down on the chair, and he'd prop his feet up on the desk, put his hands behind his head, and promptly go asleep, go, go to sleep. And uh, at the end of the class, he'd walk up and give everybody, not everybody, but all the people who did bad things, he'd give them detention slips. And they couldn't figure out how he was doing that because he was asleep the entire time. But what he did was he would go in there in the morning, and he would set his chair up, and then he would bounce it, he'd get the, that window reflecting off of that door, reflecting off that mirror in the library, so he could look at a window and get and see the entire room. 
everybody, when he was pretending to be asleep, he was actually dutifully watching them and getting them in trouble. Now, in my house, I can tell, if you go to our restroom, I can tell if you've washed your hands after going to the bathroom. I've never been, I'll never watch you go to the bathroom. You have cameras. I don't have secret cameras. I don't check the towels. I don't check the, the soap. I don't wet. check the sink. I can tell from the comfort of my sofa, I can tell if you've washed your hands. You, you hear the water? You want to know how I can do it? I'm not going to tell you. So it's just one of my tricks. I know how to do it. It just tells you that parents are smarter than what You hear the water come on. Yeah. Nope. No, better than that. Um, so, if you got here early enough, you can, you're able to see the video on YouTube. You can go home and check it out on YouTube later. But there is a proper way to wash your hands in the Jewish traditions. And uh, so we're talking about hand washing today. It's a really important deal, Christendom, to talk about hand washing. What they would do is they walk up to the uh, sink, they fill up the uh, cup, or the, the pitcher has uh, a handle on both sides. They would take off all their rings off their hands, and they would. Pass the, pass the pitcher to their right hand, let go of it, pour water on their left hand until it poured down to the wrist, and then they would pass the water, the pitcher over to the left hand, pour water on their hands, down to the wrist, and they would stick their hands up like this until the water started dripping down their elbows, and they would recite a prayer, uh, and then they would dry their hands off, and then they would be careful not to say anything until they got to the table, and they would pick up the piece of bread with all ten fingers, and then they would recite another prayer, and then they would eat, be able to eat the bread. It was very important that they did that. And that is uh, what we're going to be discussing today. So if you want to open up your Bibles, you might got a Bible. Uh, Genesis, or not Genesis, Matthew chapter 14 and 15. In chapter 14, we have uh, Jesus had just found out that his cousin John the Baptist, a very close friend, very close uh, relative, was, uh, had just been beheaded. And so he, was, he stood up to the King Herod and was killed for it. Um, he wanted to spend some time alone, so he got on a boat and headed for a deserted shore. When he got to that deserted shore, word had spread that he, was, that he was coming, and so thousands of people showed up. And so instead of getting some solitude and, and some much-needed time alone, he stood there and ministered to everybody and prayed with everybody and healed people. And, and at the end of the day, he wanted some time alone, so he said to his disciples, you guys get on the boat and start heading over to the other side of the, to where our next destination is, and said, I'll meet you over there. And they were like, how are you going to meet us over there? Well, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. And so he, Jesus prayed for a while in the wilderness for a couple hours, and then halfway across the sea, um, they looked out and they saw Jesus walking on water. And even Peter got to walk on water a little bit. Now that was a, uh, a, um, a private little miracle that he did. But he still is a pretty cool thing to do, and Peter got to walk on water. While he was there, I forgot to mention that he fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. So maybe 10, 15,000 people he fed with just bread and fish. It was, a, it was a wonderful miracle. And then they reached the other side of the destination, got on the boat, and he began healing people. There were sick people that were landed at was Gennaroset. Started healing another bunch of people, sick people. Um, everybody was demon-possessed. Um, had blindness, deafness, couldn't speak, whatever, he healed them. And Jesus was doing a lot of good things within a matter of two to three days. And despite having a, a heavy heart, uh, he was still doing all those things. And then the scribes and the Pharisees showed up. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were like the holy party poopers. And that's where we're going to get going in today. Matthew chapter 15, 1 and 2. Michaela, can you read that for us? Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do, you, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. So after all the things that Jesus did and went through the last couple of days, it was the hand washing that ticked them off. He fed 5,000 people and uh, he fed 5,000 people, he walked on water, he healed and, and ministered to everybody, but it was the hand washing that ticked them off. <laughs> so it's uh, so it was a hand washing. So why was the big deal about the hand washing? Well, Jesus rebelled against the religion, religious culture of the day because of all the rules and the traditions that they gave, that they had. Moses had the Ten Commandments um, given to him by God. God God was on a mound. He said, "I want to meet with Moses. Come on up here." Moses went out there. He got the Ten Commandments chiseled on on a stone form. Had ten basic rules: 
And then after that, there are some more basic rules added onto it, but it's the Ten Commandments that everybody knows and, and holds dear. But, um, and what the religious leaders did was they were like, we have these Ten Commandments here, and in order to not break those Ten Commandments, we want to we want to add these other rules, and so they added rules so you would not break those commandments. So if you broke one of these rules, you're getting close to breaking one of the Ten Commandments. So they set up like a think about it, if you have something that's really precious to you, like a, a painting or a statue or something in your yard that you want to keep that's beautiful, or a tree or something like that, and you want to keep it. So you want to keep it nice. So you put a fence around it so you can protect it. But then you're like, you know, that neighbor kid, he could kick a ball over that fence. I'm going to build a taller one and I'm going to put a roof on there. And then, like, well, he can still kind of see it, and someone could, could, could look into and stick a little whatever, some poison or whatever, and shoot some poison on my tree, whatever. And so they build another fence around it, and then they build another fence and another fence and another fence and another fence until eventually you can't even see the, ten, the, the most precious, beautiful saying in this story is the Ten Commandments. Um, they had so many rules. By the time Jesus was around, they had like some 5,000 rules and traditions in order to not break the Ten Commandments. For instance, uh, one of the Ten Commandments says, keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, what does that mean? Sabbath day is Saturday. How are we to keep it holy? Can you work on Saturday? If you can't work, what constitutes work? Can you cook food for your kids on Saturday? No. Can you reheat food no. on Saturday? Could you walk? Well, sure. Can you, uh, can you throw a ball in your hands? These are all things that needed to be clarified in order so you would not break in that, that keep the Sabbath day holy. Um, it says, honor your father and mother. How do you honor your father and your mother? How do you... Uh, and so you, you kind of get the idea that they built all these fences around to protect this, and they got to the point where they were so, so interested in, in keeping these rules and regulations like hand-washing, there's no th nothing in the Bible about proper hand washing. But they got ticked off at Jesus because he wasn't washing his hands properly. So there's nothing in the Bible about hand washing, but it was one of these rules and regulations and traditions that they established to keep from breaking these Ten Commandments. That they would rather have you break, almost rather have you break one of the Ten Commandments than break one of these religious rules. And so, we had Jesus' answer in Matthew 15, 3-9. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment? Because if you remember, Jesus was just challenged, why do your friends not wash their hands? And Jesus said, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, and he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching those doctrines the commandments of men. If you have a choice between breaking a commandment of God or breaking a law or a tradition of man, which would you rather do? I'd rather break the law of man. But they're making it so hard that they're like, you have to obey these, even if it goes against God. And what these people were talking about is an act of Corbin. It's a Hebrew word. Uh, if, if um, let's say you have a million dollars, and your parents are getting kind of elderly, and you're supposed to be honoring your father and your mother. They raised you, so now it's your turn to help um, take care of them in their elder, elderly years, but you say, hey, I donated, this is a gift to God. My million dollars that I have is a gift to God. I'm not allowed spending it on anybody but God. And what happens is that person can now live the rest of his life dwindling that million dollars down to nothing if he wants to, as long as he's spending it on himself, and then when he dies, whatever's left goes to the temple. Rather than taking care of his mom and his dad and elder, other people, do you guys think that that really honors your father and mother? Do you think that that really honors God? I could be giving this gift to my parents who helped me when I was in need, but no, I'm not going to help them. I'm just going to keep it for myself, and then when I die, I'm going to give it to the temple. And I'm not going to help anybody. That's not honoring to God. That's what they did. Now, these were rules and traditions that, that man made that dishonored God. They honored man and dishonored God. Let's keep moving. Matthew chapter 15, 10 through 20. 
After, he, after they asked him, why do your disciples not wash your hands? And he asked them a question. After, I saw my son wandering the sidewalk out there. So after he, uh, after he, they asked him, why do your disciples not wash your hands? And he said, why do you break the laws of God in, in order to keep the traditions of man? And, uh, and, then, and then he went on after they, the scribes and the Pharisees got real ticked. Then he gathered everybody together and said, hey, listen up, i got something I want to tell you. And then this is what he said. He called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when you, they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of your heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but not. But to eat with unwashed hands does not follow, defile anyone. He was going against the control and the authority and the tradition of his day. He was rebelling against it. And to be honest with you, Jesus isn't interested in you following the rules and the traditions of man. And he's not really all that interested in you following the rules and the traditions of God. What he is interested in is to having a right relationship with you. Now, once you have that right relationship with, with God, then you're going to want to do all these things. Many people will say, well, I'll come to know Jesus. I'll get religious. I'll, I'll do that when I get my life put back together, and then I'll start doing the Ten Commandments. And then, or and once I start doing the Ten Commandments, then I'll start coming to church and being good. That's exactly opposite of what God wants. God wants a relationship with you, and then once you have that relationship with Him, then He's going to start working on the things. God change your desires, change your interests, change your heart, until you become something that desires to be more like Christ. It's like a statue. At, at the beginning, it's just a big chunk of rock. And what He does is the, car, or the uh, sculptor just chisels away things that doesn't look like whatever He wants. God wants us to look like Christ. And so what he's doing is he's got this big chunk of rock, and what he's doing is he's chiseling away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. You're into pornography, you're into drugs, into uh, stealing things, into uh, beating people up. You know, all of these things don't, don't look like Christ, but what he's doing is he's slowly but surely chipping away everything that doesn't look like Christ, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, what you need to do and I encourage you to find out more about them. If you're, not, if you're here today, you're like, I know that if I die today, I would go to hell. Then and you, it's good news because you're in the right room and we can help you with that. If you know that you do know that if you died today, you would go to heaven, it's good news. But if you have some things in your heart that you don't know, that, that's uh, like, hey, I am really into uh, pornography. I am really into drinking. I'm really into drugs. And I want to get rid of that part of my life. I know I'm going to heaven, but I've still got these things that are holding me back. We can help you with that too. So all you need to do is come talk to us, and we can help you with that. But if you want to, uh, if you want to be a Christian, you're going to have to, there's times in your life you're going to have to say, am I going to follow God? Or am I going to have to follow the laws of man? And the laws of man may not exactly follow the laws of God. And you're going to have to stand up for them. It's a hard choice. But that's what the thing you're going to have to look at. But let's pray. Uh, I, uh, if you have any questions about tonight, if you have any questions about, man, I just, I just feel like there's something missing in my life. I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Please, come talk. Or if you're feeling, yeah, I do know i got to go to heaven, but isn't there more life than just knowing that I'm going to go someplace when I die? Then come talk to me about that too. We can help you. Jesus didn't come down to earth to, uh, Jesus didn't come to earth to encourage people who are already keeping the law. Hey, you're doing a great job, just keep it up. Jesus came down to earth because we couldn't keep the law and we needed something better. He needed, we needed to, 
We needed a sacrifice. He needed to die in order for us to go to heaven. When Jesus came from earth, think about this. When Jesus came to earth, he went from heaven to earth. Everything that's great about heaven was just that much taken away from him when Jesus came down here. God bankrupted heaven to give us Jesus. God cracked the piggy bank of heaven to give us Jesus. And we can't go to heaven without him, no matter how many good works we do, no matter how many laws we make, and no matter how many laws we keep. We can't, we can't be good enough to go to heaven. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for just this time that we get to gather together. And Lord, I just pray that my words are clear tonight. That I was speaking for you, and not for myself. And I just ask you to bless every single people, person in this room. And I pray that everybody will know tonight whether or not they're going to go to heaven. I just ask for blessing on it. In Jesus' name.